is happening all over the world, though it's underreported in the mass media. Our next segment is the Nonviolence Report with Michael Nagler. Michael's the president of the Meta Center for Nonviolence and author of The Third Harmony, Nonviolence and the New Story of Human Nature, as well as the Nonviolence Handbook. He'll share news, events, and analyses which might even inspire you to take action where you live. Let's tune in. Greetings, everyone. This is Michael Nagler. I'm back again with the Nonviolence Report, and with many thanks to Julia White, our researcher. I'd like to dive right in, first of all, to give you some of the resources that are available for us uh, studying and performing nonviolence these days. There is another breakthrough in my former field, academia. The University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee is now offering a Master of Sustainable Peacebuilding, MSP, a new degree, and apparently offering this through the College of Nursing, which uh, I find some quite appropriate. <laughs> Now, going abroad for a minute, the Gandhi Peace Foundation in northern India is doing a South Asia premiere of our film, The Third Harmony, and that will take place on May 8th. And I think if you look for a Gandhi Peace Foundation in a town called Jalgaon, North India, uh, you can get their poster, which is very attractive. Back here in the States, Meta Peace Teams, uh, that's Meta with one T, our brother organization and sister organization in Detroit and Ann Arbor, has a great deal that's going on this spring. And here are just some of the events coming up. They're doing another presentation of the documentary In Peace We Trust, which features some of their own work. There's a training opportunity for members of uh, Pax Christi USA and the National Catholic Peace Organization. There is a list of upcoming skills trainings that they'll be offering that are open to the public. An exciting webinar being offered by their own founder, Father Peter Dougherty. An opportunity for you to practice nonviolence de-escalation skills. This would be a joint effort with us, the Meta Center for Nonviolence in Petaluma. And of course, they say, last but not least, a clearance sale for the last of their fair trade olive oil from Palestine. So that is Meta Peace Teams. Keep checking also Campaign Nonviolence. They also have a whole month of skill training workshops going on, which really put together all of those trainings constitutes a huge quantitative and qualitative advance uh, in the practice of nonviolence in the world. There's a new book that's come out from a colleague and a former guest on this program, Professor Stephen Zunas of the University of San Francisco. It's available online. It's a 44-page pamphlet, and it talks about an exemplary success in nonviolence. The title of the book is Sudan's 2019 Revolution. It is a monograph from the International Center on nonviolent conflict. Here's one quote that Stephen offers. The scenes of millions of Sudanese out on the streets during waves of protest over an eight-month period in 2018 to 2019 demonstrate a triumph not just of the human spirit, but of some of the most brilliant strategic thinking by any social movement in history. I've started the pamphlet, and it looks really very promising and very helpful. Now, uh, another colleague, a former director of uh, the Peace and Justice Studies Association, Professor Randall Amster, on May 3rd will be giving a talk on nonviolence that you can find at www, period, cpp, period, edu, and slash Ahimsa Center. There's going to be also a virtual mobilization for a group called Children at the Border on May 8th and 9th, and allchildrenallborders.org will take you there. 
That's no spaces. All children, all borders dot org. One of the hot issues, as we'll see very shortly, is housing uh, in the nonviolent world today. And on May 12th and 13th, there's going to be a summit called the Housing Solution Summit, which is also online. This URL has dashes. Housing-solution-summit-2021. And finally, uh, coming from a group called One Earth Peace, Dot org. There's going to be on the 15th, moving on into the middle of next month, a 90-minute introduction to Kingian nonviolence. That one I haven't checked out, but it, it uh, looks very promising. Now, moving on to some actions going on, there is on the 8th of May coming up a National John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Day which, of course, is critically important given some recent legislation that's been proposed by a certain party to actually limit voting access around the country. So this is going to be some one of the events connected with the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Day will, though it's national, include a votercade right here in Petaluma. So now moving from the local to the global, in Berlin... The German Supreme Court recently repealed what they call the rent cap, the Berlin rent cap. The fear here is that it will result in huge rent increases, arrears payments, and actually poverty for hundreds of people. So despite the pandemic, because this will in fact expose many people to the pandemic, more than 10,000 people hit the streets this week in spontaneously organized protests the day that this was announced, and there are more likely coming up on the horizon. So that term, spontaneously organized protests, should make us think immediately that we know what the next step is. It's towards that strategic thinking that Professor Zunas has laid out in his book on Sudan's revolution. Now, here's a good example of two things. Spectrum communication workers in New York have come together after one of the longest strikes in U.S. history. It went on for four years in hopes of gaining retirement, health care, and other benefits that were taken away from them. These workers decided, instead of asking for something from others, to create their own worker-owned and democratically run internet service provider. It's called People's Choice Communications. So this is a perfect example of timing. They didn't go to this action right away. They had a long, long strike in which they gave Spectrum the opportunity to respond to their demands. And then when that didn't happen, instead of just demanding more and more, they went back on their own resources. And when they did that, so there's two principles right there in nonviolence, a timing and constructive program. And as usual, when you do things in nonviolence, the things that you build are better than the alternatives that you were trying to get from others because this is going to be worker-owned and democratically run, and it's the first such in the world. Speaking of firsts, we recently saw the first global scientist rebellion. Over a hundred scientists engaged in nonviolent direct action of one kind or another. The idea here was to help those who might not be taking climate change seriously to get some perspective. The scientists are behaving as though the climate change were an emergency, which it is. And they hosted teach-ins in which, at various campuses, the normal syllabus was tossed aside and replaced with lessons on the climate crisis. And they're planning a second global scientist rebellion, that's their term, not mine, global scientist rebellion for June. Now, uh, down from 100 scientists to an individual, a woman by the name of Diana Wilson, who was 72, and she's a retired shrimper, shrimp harvester, and she's already two weeks into a hunger strike, 
What she's trying to do is to get enough attention to her efforts that will pressure the Biden administration to stop a Houston-based oil and gas firm, to stop their midstreams is the name of the firm, to stop their plans to deepen and widen the Mata Gorda ship channel. They're planning to get this done by 2023. It would allow room for larger vessels to pass through and dramatically increase the export of oil, which already is a bad idea. Diana worries that it will also toxify the waters as the dredging would unearth mercury contamination from the Bay System's Alcoa Superfund site, and it would devastate local fisheries. So there's this intersectionality of climate and other issues and, and a dramatic action carried out by an individual, an elderly woman, Diana Wilson. Now, it could be that uh, her strike, her hunger strike, her fast uh, is not quite in line with all the requirements that Gandhi discovered in his career, but um, let's wish her the very best anyway. Now, here's something really positive looking and new again. The Coal Miners Union says that it would be happy to transition to renewable energy and green jobs as long as retraining and income support during the transition could be guaranteed. So this is, a, again, a wonderful example of how Construct a Program can work and build something better than the previous uh, alternative. It shows that workers are not necessarily at all the stumbling block in getting off fossil fuels. That, that's important. I, I remember a friend of mine who was uh, at a protest in Maine. This is uh, Sherry Mitchell, whom we have also interviewed here. Uh, they were sitting around a campfire one night protesting oil extraction in a lake which was the only source of water for their community. And a trucker drove by. He was, you know, one of the truckers from the company that was trying to do this. So there's somebody that they were protesting. And he stopped the truck, came over to them weeping and said, I don't want to do this. I would do anything else, but I need to feed my family. So what we've been talking about here are constructive ways to meet that very legitimate need without uh, lending our resources and our uh, efforts to other people's work and destroying the climate in the process. So just one other thing that I'll share with you this week, though there is, of course, a very great deal going on. This is in Sudan, in Bentiu. I believe this is South Sudan, where the Nonviolent Peace Force has been very active. And you can, of course, see some of that in our film, a very dramatic episode of the Nonviolent Peace Force work in South Sudan occurs in our film. And one of the things that NP has been doing is promoting women protection teams. And now many women are taking that up. So again, this is a good example of how a third party goes in, innovates something, lends resources to it, and then the people on the ground can take it up and do it themselves. So these uh, women protection teams are nonviolent, unarmed, civilian-led teams. They work uh, often in collaboration with each other, and they travel with each other to fetch resources. The importance here is that this prevents sexual and domestic violence, which had become an increasingly big problem in recent years. At one point, they had 150 incidents reported to them in 10 days. So that is what I wanted to share with you for this week. Please stay with us as the nonviolence world continues to expand in wonderful ways. And until then, Take care of one another, as Stephanie Van Hook would say. Thank you.